Good evening. My name is Liza Gentile, and I'm a proud JWU alumna and the Assistant Director of Alumni Relations at Johnson Wales University. Thank you for joining us for our special reunion edition of Cook Along with JWU. We're excited to cook along with one of our amazing alums and kick off reunion week. As a special treat for attending this evening, you'll be entered into a drawing to receive either a handmade charcuterie board or a coaster set handcrafted by fellow alum Michael DeQuatro, class of 2008. When the trade show and conference industry shut down due to COVID, Mike used his time at home to turn his woodworking hobby into a business and created 161st Woodshop. Be sure to check him out on social media. You'll also be entered into a separate drawing to win a JWU swag bag. While we're, <clears throat> while we're sad not to be together in person this year, we want to make this event as social as possible. With that said, please keep your cameras on throughout the event, but keep your mics muted. If you have a question about the recipe while we're cooking, use the raise hand feature located within the participant button. I will call on you and invite you to turn on your mic and ask your question. If you'd prefer, you can type your question into the chat and I will read it aloud. We'll also have time at the end of the demo for questions. I'd now like to introduce tonight's presenter. Joseph M. Leonardi, class of 97 and 99 with his master's, is the director of culinary operations at the Country Club in Chestnut Hill, Massachusetts. Since joining in 2016, he's overseen a full-time culinary team of 30 and is responsible for all food and beverage on the property. Previously, he was the executive chef at the Somerset Club in Boston and served as the department chair of culinary arts and assistant professor at Johnson & Wales University in Providence. A member of the American Culinary Federation, Joseph holds a bachelor's degree in culinary arts and a master's degree in applied teaching from Johnson & Wales University. An avid competitor, Leonardi has amassed numerous awards at the regional, national, and international level. Chef Leonardi was inducted into the American Academy of Chefs in 2020 after earning the prestigious title of Certified Master Chef in 2017. It's the American Culinary Federation's highest and most demanding level of achievement in the culinary industry, elevating him to one of just 71 certified master chefs in the United States and the only certified master chef in Massachusetts. At the ACF's 2009 National Convention, Joseph was named the USA's Chef of the Year. And just last week, the Rhode Island chapter of the ACF named him Chef of the Year. Chef Leonardi is also a former manager and team member of the ACF Culinary Team USA, the official team representing the United States and all international competitors and whose mission is to be the standard of excellence for the culinary industry. Leonardi has won over 20 gold medals and numerous silver medals during the past 15 years. And in 2016, under his direction, elevated the ACF Culinary Team USA to world champion status at the culinary of the culinary arts display. Additionally, he's the founder of Leonardi Culinary Management Concepts, a consulting firm that assists various food and beverage operations with strategic planning and development. In his spare time, Joseph enjoys beekeeping and established Leonardi Apiary and Gardens with the mission to educate communities about the importance of bees and their impact on our environment. Please join me in welcoming Chef Leonardi. Chef, I'll turn it over to you to get us started with the demo. Great. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it and, um, and truly am honored to be part of this event this week and, and super stoked to be starting off the week uh, for sure. So thank you again for, uh, for having me. Uh, here, uh, as, as Liza said, um, I've been a beekeeper and a lot of people uh, have started recognizing me for beekeeping and some things that I've been doing with the bees and, and so on. I actually started beekeeping about six years ago, a little over six years ago. And um, at my current job, the, the country club up in Brookline, Mass, uh, we had a couple of beehives there and nobody really knew how to take care of them. And to be honest with you, nobody really wanted to go near them because there were a lot of bees in them. Unfortunately, the bees uh, absconded, they, they left the hives and went elsewhere. So at that point in time, we all kind of felt, well, maybe we should get rid of them, you know, move, move their hive boxes off property and, and, and just forget about it. Well, I have to be honest, I was the one that had to move them. And when I went to move the boxes, they were probably 
about 150 pounds total. And when I opened up the box and I saw this golden liquid in there and this beautiful floral aroma, I, I knew I couldn't get rid of it. And I knew that um, there was something more there that uh, I wanted to investigate and, and see about. So I had asked the general manager at the time, hey, instead of throwing out these boxes, can I take them home? And he said, sure, go right ahead. So I took them home and uh, we opened them up and there was tons and tons of honey in there. And that's what kind of triggered my beekeeping. So I did, a, I was a YouTube beekeeper for the first year. Um, very unsuccessful. Uh, I don't recommend that for, for anybody that might have an interest in beekeeping. Uh, definitely join a, a local organization get the support, get the mentorship. And that's actually what I ended up doing was, was joining a, uh, a local group here. And they supported me, taught me. And here I am six years later, the business had, the business currently right now is running with 30 full beehives uh, or full colonies with supers on them. And then in addition to that, we have 10 nukes, which I'll explain to you what a nuke is. And the nukes actually support all the other colonies. So, um, you know, we'll produce our own queens. I'll take the, you know, some brood and eggs from those little nukes and, and I'll support the other colonies if someone, one of the uh, colonies are, are weak. So um, we generate probably close to a thousand pounds of honey for the last two years. Uh, I have no control over that. Uh, it's all of the bees and where they're going and where they're located. We have five locations right now uh, from Rhode Island out to Rehoboth, Mass, up to Boston, uh, Massachusetts. So um, it's, it's started off as a hobby with two hives. And now here we are today, six years later, producing, uh, as I call it, liquid gold. So um, with, with that being said, I kind of want to jump into um the the dish tonight that we're going to cook so hot chili hot chili right now is is a is a big topic out there and, and people are looking for that um uh, you know the the spicy and the the sweet chili you know the the honey that's out there and uh we came up with our own blend of spicy honey so one night we were cooking and i felt um putting in Um, chef, I think one of your mics just muted. I'm not sure what happened. How about now? Is that better? Perfect. All right. Sorry about that. So, so we're going to make some, um, chili honey glaze salmon tonight, and then, uh, a, a nice tapioca dish to kind of go along with it that, um, is seasoned with some coriander, some fennel and, um, some mirum, and then a little, uh, Thai basil at the end. Uh, we're going to fold into it. And then we have a really nice fish vinaigrette um, to go around the dish as well. So if you haven't started your tapioca, uh, we already had pre-cooked ours. Um, if you haven't, get yourself a little saucepan, fill it up with some hot water, pinch of salt, get that up to a boil, and then you can drop that tapioca in there and, uh, and cook it almost like pasta till it's clear. So tapioca is white. And then when you cook it, uh, it'll turn translucent. So a lot of people don't know where um, honey, why this is heating up. We'll, we're going to talk a little bit about honey, but uh, a lot of people don't know where honey comes from, believe it or not. Um, some people will say, well, it just comes from the flowers. And that's correct to a point. That is correct. Uh, but there's a lot of work that goes into it. So as a beekeeper, we don't do anything to the honey. So raw honey is honey as it exists inside the colonies. We don't do anything to it. So I'll go to the colony. I'll pull out a frame that's all capped and looking beautiful. I'll cut the, the wax cappings off it. And then I'll extract all that honey. That's raw honey. 
that's the, the pure state of honey. It's the most uh, healthiest for you. And right now in allergy season, uh, people are, are going crazy for it. Okay, so with the tapioca, we're gonna take some minced onion. We're gonna add some minced onion in there. And then I have some garlic. Isabel, maybe move that over if they can't see. I'm not sure. And all that we're going to do is start to saute that off. We're going to add some fennel. And we're going to add in there a little tapioca. I mean, uh, coriander, sorry. And then continue to just cook that. Okay, now we're going to take our white wine. We're going to deglaze. Then we're going to let that cook. So going back to the honey, why that there is reducing. People are correct. The honey does come from flowers and it comes from the, the sugar secretions from the flowers, the, the um, nectar. But nectar is about 80% water and it's filled with sucrose, which is a form of sugar. What will actually happen is the bees will go to the flowers wherever that nectar is flowing. The bees are going to go there and then they will start to pull out that nectar. As soon as they start pulling out that nectar, they produce an enzyme inside their body. That enzyme actually starts breaking down the sugar inside. Um, I'm sorry. The bee will produce an enzyme that breaks down the sugar in the nectar, which will then turn it into fructose and glucose, which is easier for us to digest. That will happen over time. So what will happen is the bees will go out and get that nectar, bring it back. While they're bringing it back, their body is producing that enzyme. When they get back to the hive, now this is where it gets a little freaky. When it gets back to the hive, the bee, they have to regurgitate it to the other bees. So you can call honey bee puke, you can call it whatever you want, but we all know that we love it, but that's the way how it gets into the hive. And then what'll happen over time is, they'll do that for about 15, 20 minutes. They'll, they'll take the nectar and then give it to B to B to B. And then they'll end up putting it into uh, the little honeycombs that we're so used to. And uh, we see them out there in stores. Then what the bees will actually do is then they'll fan that liquid. And with the fanning then will evaporate the, the other moisture inside that nectar. At that point, when the nectar has about 15% moisture or water content, that is when the bees will then cap that with the wax. They will not cap it before it's about 15 to 18% moisture content. So there is a process, believe it or not. And they're the, actually the only creatures that can do something like that without man's help. So now with the tapioca, as it's starting to cook, We've added coconut milk. I'm gonna add in there a little mirum at this point as well. And then I like to use cilantro stems. So I have some stems here. Just gonna cut them up. I'm gonna throw them in there just for a little flavor. 
And now we're gonna just let that finish cooking, reduce down, and then get a little creamy on us. Any questions so far? I'm not sure, Eliza, I can't see my screen if something's come up. I don't see any yet, but if anyone has them, please either raise your hand or use the raise hand feature and I'll call on you. Any questions about the bees that I can help you out with? No, huh? Wow. This is a quiet bunch. Uh, Lisa, it looks like you have your hand up. Do you want to turn on your mic and ask your question? Hi, sorry, I'm actually cooking dinner too at the same time. Perfect. Do you need a lot of sun for those bees? Do we need a lot of sun? That's what I heard because we have a lot of trees and we'd love to get bees, but we hear we need more sun. So as long as that they're able to get some sunlight throughout the day, morning sunlight is the best because it warms up the hive um, after a late, you know, a long night. Um, but the bees, the beehives that are behind us, they get no sun until about 12 o'clock. And then the afternoon all the way till the sun sets uh, is when they'll get their sun. So um, to answer your question, I, I mean, I know I'm gonna contradict some people that are out there, but um, I, as long as they're getting about six hours of sunlight, it's fine. I haven't had any problems with it. Thank you. You're welcome. Where do you live? We're in Cumberland. Cumberland, Rhode Island? Yes. Oh, why don't you come by and visit? Where, <laughs> where are you? Uh, Plainville. Oh, okay. Very close. Yeah. We'll do that. Yeah, absolutely. More than welcome to come by. Great. Um, Chef, we have a question from Vera. Can you talk a little bit more about honey and allergies? Sure. Well, I'm sorry, who is that from? It's from Vera Gall. Hi, Vera. How are you? I'm great, Joe. It's great to see you. Thank you. So, um, Vera, with the raw honey, because it's not being processed. So some of the honey that you'll see in the supermarkets or where we're buying large quantities of them, they actually pasteurize their honey. So when they pasteurize it, they're, they're removing, well, it, they're pasteurizing it to kill the yeast inside the, the honey. But then they're also removing any of those, uh, the, the pollen that the bees are bringing in, the flowers, um, you know, where they're going to get the pollen or the nectar. That's what people are allergic to. So what we've seen up over here in mass, I, I believe that if you're eating honey in, your, in a certain five to 10 mile radius of your house, you will come, um, oh, my daughter's like, huh? Uh, you will come uh, uh, immune to those seasonal allergies. All of my kids take honey uh, every day. I, you know, take honey every day. Um, very little allergies uh, that we have. And, you know, we don't have any. It's, it's big and I believe in it. So I don't know if that answers your question. Can I ask a follow up question? Sure. So uh, how much honey do you have to take every day to begin to get immunity to the allergies? Vera, that's a good question. And I don't have the, the scientific answer for you for that. Um, all that I can say is, is that if you take it day in and day out, like taking a vitamin, eventually your, your body is going to become immune to it. Um, you know, we start taking, 
I don't get honey from the beehives up here until now, May, June. I have honey that's left over from last year that we will start taking in March to start preparing for the allergy season or the pollen season really up here for like April and the beginning of May. We don't suffer from any of the allergies. So maybe four weeks, but I don't, I don't have any scientific data on that or, or anything like that. Thanks so much, Joe. Appreciate it. You're welcome. All right, so we're going to start this, the salmon. We have some Atlantic salmon over here. I'm going to season this with some salt and some pepper, and then we're going to sear it off in our saute pan. While it's sauteing off, we're going to add in there some shallots. We're going to add in there some garlic, maybe a little ginger, and then we're going to add in there a little lime juice and some white wine. That'll And a little fish stock we'll add in there just for a little moisture. That'll reduce down a little bit. And then I'm gonna add in there some uh, honey. Here's a little honey bee. And then we're gonna add in there a little uh, honey chili, uh, honey that uh, that we have here. So let's get started on that. So we have a quick question from Allison. She's wondering if the skin should be on the salmon. Um, if you have the skin on the salmon, that's fine. Um, I don't eat the skin on the salmon, so I would remove it. So we're gonna season it up with some salt and pepper. I have an audience over here, my wife, my, my kids. I feel like I'm in the exam all over again. So here's a little oil going into the pan, and now we're going to sear off the fish. Chef, we have a question from Dion about the bees. She's wondering if the honeycomb is edible. Oh yeah, absolutely. It is wax. Just so you know, you, you know, it is wax. So when you eat it, um, you know, it's going to get stuck in your teeth and things like that. But me, I would just cut out a piece and then I just chew on it and then I would just discard the, the wax. But yes, it is edible. There's actually a lot of um, stuff that you can get from a beehive. Um, you know, and, and use it. The bees also produce, uh, it's called propolis. And propolis is made from tree resin and they use it on the inside of the hive. Um, I mean, really the best way to, to describe it is if there's a breeze or something coming into the hive, they'll take this resin and then they paste it on the side where, they, where the breeze is coming in and then it stops the breeze from coming in, almost like spackle, like what we would use in our houses. We don't produce also any honeycomb. So a lot of people will call up and they'll say, oh, you know, can I get, you know, honeycomb? The problem with that is when, when the bees make that frame, there's nothing there. So our frames have a foundation in them and then the bees build off that foundation. When you do honeycomb, there's no foundation there. So it takes the bees a little bit longer to build that out and then be able to put the cells there for them to fill it with the nectar or eggs. So we choose not to do honeycomb simply because of that reason. We have a, another question from Vera. She sure. said, I often see flavored honey. Is it natural flavor or how does the flavor get added to the honey? 
Yeah. So that's the trick. So we have about eight different types of flavored honey here. We do not heat any of our honey to flavor it. So we use a different process when we flavor our honeys. Some places will, just let me strain this off. So some places will actually um, heat up the honey. Some people will actually heat up the honey in order to flavor it. We choose not to. Chef, can you tell us what you just added to that pan for the flame? What'd you say? What you added to the pan to get the flame. Oh, uh, white wine. <laughs> yeah. Why did it look bad, Liza? A little no, we were just, we were just curious for those that are coming <laughs> along at home. <laughs> Yeah, it was a little warm over here. <laughs> so I'm just going to pull these out so I can finish making my glaze and not overcook them. And what else was in the glaze in addition to the white wine? So what we added in there was, again, a little ginger, some lemon juice. I'm going to put in there a little lemon zest. There's Fresno pepper in there, some garlic, and a little shallot. And then I am going to add in there a pinch of chopped cilantro. The other thing now that I'm going to do too is I'm going to take some of that basil and I'm going to go back to the tapioca. And what we're going to do is I'm going to cut it up nice and thin. And then we're going to fold this into our tapioca now as well. Just about ready. So we were out this today and we had beautiful asparagus in the garden. So we decided to pick some and I just wanted to add some to this dish. However, if you wanted to add a different vegetable, you could always add like a bok choy um, something along that line. Uh, 
All right. So we're going to put in there some asparagus. Fresh garlic. A little salt. Cracked black pepper. Okay. While these here are warming up, No. Now we have one more thing that we need to make, and that's the fish vinaigrette. So now with the fish vinaigrette, Isabella, come over on this side. Seven oh five. This is how we're gonna make it. Very easy. We're gonna add in there the fish sauce. We have some scallion. We're going to cut the scallion. We're going to add that in there. We're going to take some mint. No questions, huh, Liza? We do have one more about the honey. Um, okay. Josh and Jen are wondering, can you age honey before bottling? So I have to understand more what they mean by the aging process. So I could say what I do, I would, I would. So if I was going to age the honey, I would leave it in the comb because it's going to pick up any type of flavor, aroma that is inside that hive. The other thing that I also do is I will leave the honey that's capped inside the hives over the winter with the bees. In March, I will go to those hives. I don't pull out all that honey because I need those bees to have food in there in order to survive uh, and make it to May. Um, but I will pull out some of it and I will use that as overwintered uh, honey. Definitely has a more earthy, caramelized sugar um, flavor to it. We're gonna take uh, some fresh lemon, I mean, uh, fresh lime, I'm sorry. We added that. Then we're going to add in there a little fresh ginger. And now I'm going to take the juice from the lime. We're going to add that. Right there. Stir that up. Okay. I'm going to add my Turn my glaze back on. Okay. 
get that warm. Side. I'm going to play it over here. Okay. Looks like we have a question from Lori while you get ready to plate. Sure. Hi, Chef. Uh, I noticed when you added the scallion, you had actually cut the white of the scallion, and that's the part of it that you added. Is the flavor profile different if you use the white versus the green end? Um, it's it's a, to me, it's a little bit more milder and not as strong. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. That was a good eye. <laughs> I always think of those as the ends, but that's where you started. So I was curious. <laughs> I wish we were there to taste this when it comes out of the pan. It does smell pretty good. <laughs> yeah. I bet. Yeah, chef, you didn't tell me where you were. <laughs> I'm close by. Laneville, right up the road. <laughs> so all of us, I know that I'm just going to go back to that flavored honey question. All of the honey that we flavor, um, we infuse it uh, under vacuum. So we don't apply any heat to the, the honey. Uh, everything is aged uh, inside the bags. Um, and then, you know, once they're ready, then, uh, we'll take them out of the bags and then bottle them unless it's just plain wildflower honey. And we'll, all that we do with that is we'll just extract it from the colony and, uh, and then bottle that immediately. Okay. Let me add some asparagus to the plate. I'm going to add a little spoonful of tapioca. We have our fish. And then what we're going to do is take our fish sauce vinaigrette. And then we just go around with that. And that's the dish. Pretty easy to make, not hard. Lots of flavor. Seasonal, fun. So. That looks amazing, chef. We have another question from Vera. She's wondering if we can buy honey from you and if we can do it online or if she needs to make a trip to Massachusetts. Well, anybody's welcome to come to Massachusetts, especially Vera. But yes, if you go to all things, www.allthingshoneyandmore.com, that's our website. And um, for sure, um, you know, if you would like to support us, That'd be wonderful. Any other questions from our alumni in attendance? Feel free to raise your hand.
So I'll give you a, a quick statistic, uh, Lori, why we're waiting, Eliza. If anybody knows how many flowers bees need to go to to make one pound of honey, the first person, and I, I'm not sure how we could do this, but well, I guess I could just tell you the answer. So <laughs> does, does anybody know how many flowers a bee needs to go to to make one pound of honey? No, but I was going to ask you that. I was going to ask you that earlier. <laughs> Too bad I didn't. Two million. Two million flowers a bee needs to go to in order to make one pound of honey. Wow. That's a lot of flowers. That's a lot of flowers. And um, I'll give you another quick, you know, when I first started beekeeping, I would, I'll admit it was all about the honey and I didn't care about anything else. All I wanted was the honey out of there. But then I started to do a lot of research and understand the importance of having honeybees around. If you enjoy eating almonds, the crops or the, or the farms out in California that produce almonds rely solely on the honeybee population or, or pollination, I should say, in order to produce those almonds. So without the honeybees, there is no almonds. Okay. So I, I think a lot of times we don't realize the, the impact such as like apples and cranberries, melons, broccoli, over 90% dependent on honeybee pollination. So without the honeybees, our food sources would be real scarce. So. Wow. So. Uh, we have a we have another question from Lisa. Um, okay. She said, "Do you recommend taking a class on how to keep bees?" Do I recommend what? Taking a class on oh. how to keep bees. Absolutely, absolutely. Don't do what I did. I was a YouTuber beekeeper for like the first year. It was a disaster. Um, you know, I thought I was doing things right, and I was watching some guy down there in Georgia doing something. And what, everything that they were doing down there was opposite of what I was supposed to be doing up here in New England. So I highly recommend taking a class, joining or attending some type of uh, bee organization and, and learn from them. Because what we do up here in New England is way different than what they do down there in Georgia or out in Texas. And uh, I don't recommend doing the YouTube thing at all. Great. Any other questions from our alumni? Okay. So with that, I would like to introduce Lori Zabata, our Director of Alumni Relations and JWU alumna to close the program. Thanks so much, Liza and Chef. Thank you so much for such an amazing demo. You made that look so easy and I do not cook. So the true test will be when I can concentrate and actually yeah. follow along with the recipes. I'll have to let you know. <laughs> sure, please do. We're so grateful to you for sharing your time and extensive knowledge with us and appreciate all that you've taught us. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of the alumni in attendance tonight. Your registration not only allowed you to celebrate reunion with your fellow alums, but also directly impacts today's Wildcats. The donation you made when you registered will be put to work immediately to support students and educators at JWU. Donations to the JWU Fund are unrestricted and allow us to say yes to upgrades, enhancements, and new ideas, as well as urgent needs on all JWU campuses. And as an alumni donor, you also contribute to the growth of JWU's reputation, which increases the value of your own JWU degree. If you'd like to further support the JWU Fund, please click the link in the chat window. Thanks again for your generosity. We sincerely hope that you enjoyed Cook Along with JWU Outdoor Edition. I hope to see you at other reunion events this week because registration is still open. Don't forget to visit alumni owned and operated restaurants in your community this weekend as part of JWU Eats as well. The full listing of participating restaurants can be found on our website at alumni.jwu.edu or via the link in the chat. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Have a wonderful evening and enjoy this beautiful weather. Thanks again, Chef. Thank you so much.